at Genoa. Thank you, uh, Walter, for organizing this meeting. Uh, in order to not forget uh, to mention who, people who actually did the work, this is the uh, picture of uh, most of the people who were involved in the projects which I'm going to show today. Uh, Chris Kutki, Chamali Narangoda, Sergeant Sakibov, um, and Dylan Patel. Uh, uh, the main character who uh, characters who did this last batch of uh, work and uh, brought up their beautiful ideas. They all graduated and finished with my group right now, so I'm actually in search of new group. <laughs> so if you uh, have people who are interested in applying to graduate schools, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh is a fantastic place to do your PhD in, uh, especially in theoretical chemistry. Right. Okay. So, moving to a very general title: structure and ion permeation of tetrameric ion channels in molecular dynamic simulations. I put all the stuff up front so no one is confused. Uh, I'm switching kind of gears to perpendicular direction here. After the majority of people are actually interested in proton uh, transfer and attachment and detachment, I'm going to talk about big particles. But lots of problems in modeling big particles such as ions in uh, computational chemistry are very similar. Uh, of course, they're bigger, so they move classically, they, they slow, they diffuse instead of disappearing and reappearing in various places, unlike protons, but they're charged. So all the problems of electrostatic interactions and especially in modeling when you're trying to transfer a particle from water into the lipid environment in the membrane channels, uh, all these problems remain. That is how to create uh, transferable interactions. So in fact, I'm not going to complain or brag about force fields and how to actually model particles too much in this presentation. I'm going to focus on uh, sampling stuff, uh, which is also a problem which has been mentioned that don't get trapped and do sample your um, system faithfully before you can make a decision about how well your force fields work. All right, so the overarching theme in this presentation is that America and channels. I think I'm, my slides are a little bit too big, but sorry. Um, they have Common, uh, this is a really big class of membrane associated proteins. Uh, this picture is of the potassium channel, which is a sort of canonic uh, tetrameric ion channel, which everybody knows about. It has been sold by McKinnon uh, in late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, this is the, uh, it's, it's an alpha helical protein. Uh, it forms transmembrane helices. The main channel kind of vestibule, the pore, is formed by the four, uh, four alpha helices, which, uh, which belong to four different, um, four different uh, monomers. So it's a tetrameric uh, protein. Uh, they all form this reentrant loops a part of the protein which doesn't go through the membrane but goes in and comes back out on the same side. And usually these reentrant loops form the selectivity filter for the ions to recognize ions. Uh, the gates can be in different positions in these channels depending on the structure of the channel. They could be in the middle, they could be just by mechanical opening of these tail, tails of these helices. And, but the general topology of the structures are all the same. And so this is kind of proteins which I'm going to simulate slightly different than idiosyncratic bunch. Uh, the top view shows you it's a tetramer, kind of symmetric for the potassium channel, but sometimes symmetry breaks depending on what kind of protein it is. Okay, so uh, the first uh, things which I'm going to talk a little bit about are glutamate receptors, which belong to this class of tetrameric receptors. Uh, they um, uh, everywhere in the central neural system, they are main. In fact, glutamate is the main neurotransmitter of the excitation in the brain. So everyone heard about oh, sorry, serotonin, dopamine, all this kind of good stuff. 
but the actual signaling, the highway of the excitation, happens by glutamate action. Glutamate binds to the ligand binding uh, domain of the glutamate receptor. Uh, it's released by the presynaptic uh, membrane. One neuron releases glutamate. The postsynaptic, the second neuron, has these receptors in the membrane. Uh, two types, two main types of glutamate receptors I'm going to show, uh, AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors. The names uh, came from the specific non-biological ligands which either receptor binds. So they both are glutamate receptors. AMD and uh, AMPA and NMD are molecules which bind either of this type, and that's how they distinguished pharmacologically. They have very different action. AMPA is the first one in the cascade of excitation. So when glutamate is released and binds to the ligand binding domain, the first channel which opens is AMPA. It's very quick. It's less than millisecond for opening and it passes current. It's not very wide channel. It doesn't pass us a lot of current, but it's the one which initiates excitation and uh, the result of excitation of the uh, neural cell is basically the current through the channel uh, depolarizes the cell, the potential across the membrane drops. Uh, and because of that, uh, other actions start happening in the cell. Uh, in fact, the second action would be that NMD receptor, which is also a glutamate receptor, uh, is blocked by a magnesium ion at physiological concentrations. That is, when the potential across the cell membrane is high, something like minus 60 millivolts, all NMDA channels are blocked by magnesium ions. Once the potential across the membrane drops to about minus 50 millivolts, magnesium starts to leave the pore of the NMDA receptor, and then it becomes um, conductive for monovalent and monovalent cations and calcium. So it permeates calcium, but it is blocked by magnesium in the voltage dependent manner. Magnesium pretty much never goes through. You need to pump up voltage hugely to push magnesium through. Most of the time it doesn't. Magnesium and calcium are very similar ions from the uh, chemist's point of view. There are differences, but in principle, they are round, spherical, have no interesting features. If you talk to inorganic chemists, they will say, who cares, because they, they round ions, they do nothing. Uh, but in fact, the biological channels separate them very, very faithfully. Calcium is a main conductor, magnesium is a blocker. So we were approached by... Um, a uh, colleague uh, across the street who was work who is working with NMDA receptor, John Johnson, and he basically said it's a puzzle. No one solved it in about 30 years since this is known. Uh, can you help? And of course, when physiologist comes to a theoretician, the problem is really intractable. It's always like that. So we did give it a shot. So I'll, I'll show you some ideas how we are trying to solve it. Okay, so starting with AMPA, the first one. So this is the uh, actual crystal structure of the AMPA receptor in full length. Uh, ATD domain does basically nothing in AMPA, regulates a little bit, but not much. Uh, LBD domain is here, ligand binding domain. That's where glutamate is bind, binds. So glutamate binds here, and then the uh, transmembrane uh, part of the channel looks like upside down potassium channel. The selectivity filter is in the bottom, and exercise you have the gate. So basically, if you cut down the next to the main LBD and TMD construct, still forms a functional channel. So this is the smallest <coughs> ligand gated receptor. <coughs> Sorry. The smallest and fastest ligand gated receptor. Uh, which exists, so that's a good candidate for modeling. Uh, roughly speaking, the scheme, how it works, looks like that. So glutamate binds to the ligand binding domain. Uh, the, you need at least two glutamates to open the receptor. 
and then the channel opens very briefly transiently. Current passes and then the channel shuts down, desensitizes, uh, and uh, the ligand is still bound. Then you need to wash out the glutamate in order to restart the, the action. Okay, so that's another fancier picture of the same. So when the glutamate comes in, those are transitions uh, of the channel in a schematic way. The gate is formed by a very, very conserved through all the glutamate receptors, conserved hydrophobic patch of alanines. As you can see, there are four actually alanines in a row because there is also alanine 617. So alanines, they four, four of them from each subunit come close to each other and they create this really hydrophobic seal at the edge of the membrane and this is the gate. So when the gate opens, so in the constriction in the closed channel, this is how it looks like. When the gate opens, uh, the, hopefully I have a picture, no, don't, not here, the um, constriction widens up, but just a little bit. So if we compare structures which now exist of the closed, open, and desensitized channel, uh, I, I mark by red the parts of the protein which change the most in the, when it functions. So this part of the uh, transmembrane helix undergoes tran transition in the opening. So these are two dimers separately. It's a tetramer and it's asymmetric on the LBD domain part. So I put two dimers, kind of two pictures separately so that you can see what's going on. And you can see that, so this shows the changes which uh, happen in the um, secondary structure so in 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 two dom two subunits in the opening the transmembrane helix unwinds a little bit and in two other subunits it sort of kinks so this is the function or action of the gate opening in this receptor which was uh found out by uh cry em crystallography basically it's high resolution structure high enough resolution structure now um, so this is called M3, this is gate, this is helix, which changes. Uh, so if you basically just do the uh, PC, kind of clean up the motion, the motion of the gating would be a closing of the clefts of the glutamate, of the ligand binding domains like this on top of the glutamate. And on the other side, this closing of the gates actually pulls up on the helix and Unwind it. So that's more or less what the protein does in order to open. Okay, physiologically though, the channel actually shows up four different conductance levels. So currents are small, but they actually glutamate dependent, and uh, one can distinguish four different conductance levels, bigger, 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 as you increase the amount of glutamate. So this is a physiological picture. And if you kind of do statistics on that, what you find that at high concentrations of glutamate, this is red, uh, the majority of the open channels will be in the first conductance level. So I, I label conductance levels as C for closed, or one or two or three or four are four different open states. And in terms of currents, the, from one to four, it goes bigger, bigger, bigger. Thank you. Uh, right, and so you can see at smaller, sorry, at small concentration of glutamate, 20 micro is small. Uh, the first conductance levels is predominantly open, but there is probability of opening all either states, right? Because it's a stochastic system. Uh, at high concentration of glutamate, which is black, 10 millimolar, the predominant open le level is O2, and other, others are also open with higher probability, and the uh, highest conducting uh, level is open with highest probability. So that's more or less physiological picture. And our collaborator, Sasha Sobolevsky, was trying to put a structural picture on top of this physiological understanding. So he created uh, cryo-EM images uh, and enough particles to try to separate uh, different 
glutamate bound states. So the blue here is unbound and closed structure. In red are binding domains which bound glutamate. So in this picture, you can see he was able to separate seven different structures from the cryo-EM images with different uh, combination of bound glutamates in them. And this is the top view of the ligand binding domains tetramers. And you can easily say, tell blue is no glutamate, pink is one glutamate, two glutamates in different orientations, three glutamates and four glutamates bound. So that was beautiful picture. However, when he looked at his pore size in the gate region, the gates, well, closed is closed, but everything else is pretty much open to the same exactly size, same exactly shape, same exactly secondary elements of structure. Uh, the structure, which is a little bit wider open, it's original uh, crystal structure. So it's from high, high glutamate concentration, different experiment. All of these came out to be the same pore. And that's again when the experimentalist calls you and says, Maria, can you simulate? Sure. Uh, seven structures, huge receptor, as tiny subtle changes in the secondary elements of structure, which I expected. Can you make a sense of it? Will it will this pore conduct different level of current? Of course not, they're the same uh, geometrically. So we had some Anton time, so we went on to simulate. So we cut off this to bare bones to just LBD and TMD, uh, set it up in the simulation. In simulation, for people who are not MD, people, this is roughly how it looks like. Lots of ions, lots of uh, water. Water is not shown. Only ions are shown in the protein. I don't know, my computer doesn't want to run this for long, but this is basically an empty simulation you do. So we started with, we populated simulations with those uh, seven structures. So this is more or less the a slightly nicer picture of the molecular dynamics setup. Uh, potassium chlorine, glutamate bound in the LBT domain. Uh, there is an auxiliary protein which was resolved in the cryo structure, which we preserved in this case. Uh, these are all markings of the structures which we are simulating. G stands for the presence of glutamate in LBD, N stands for no glutamate. So all these structures which I showed to you, we run production runs of about one to two microseconds for each of the structures and ended up with humongous amount of data. So we basically, we can look at the how protein behaves. This is a simulation. Inside the gate, this is the constriction in the open channel. So once in a while, it shuts down a little bit, but it still conducts water and ions. Uh, if you, with all these simulations, if you watch long enough, you can find an ion permeating through this channel in the absence of the voltage. I don't know, again, the movie is very slow, but basically, if you look at this green, blue, and red ions, they're all potassiums. Maybe sodiums, we switch ions on the, in the middle of the way, um, and they they basically one shows up and the other one leaves, and they colored in order to be able to watch them. And the movie doesn't work very well. Well, a little bit better movie and easier analysis is with permeating water. So through the same channels, we can look at water molecules entering the channel and going through. So we did this kind of proxy conductance by looking at the water. And we thought maybe we can make some sense out of all the structures. Uh, so if you look at the ions cumulatively it's through the whole trajectory, you could easily see that, of course, uh, chlorine ions never go in and uh, sodium ions in the closed channel, they never cross the gate region, but they do cross uh, in the open channel simulation, this is very long simulations, cumulative uh, accumulation of ions basically shown here. Uh, we looked at the structures naturally, how they change during the simulations, everything is free. Uh, we found that in the structures, there are some conformational transitions at the gate. So this is a one situation when all, all four helices at the gate bend symmetrically. So we do see changes in the structure of the gate uh, during simulations. 
although all the so basically maybe this is a little bit easier to see. So one can see now transition to the bending of the helices for the those which were straight. So we expect a wider opening. Uh, I skip through the machine learning stuff. So basically we ended up, I'm not going to explain all of this. Uh, we ended up with <laughs> humongous amount of data and we need to analyze trajectories. And naturally we need to try to figure out which features of the structure are actually responsible for the uh, differences which we can observe. And we can think of million of ways to compute structural factors on the protein structure. So we basically employed the machine learning methods to sort things through. So I, I'll go over this. I'm not going to explain the theory and I have, of course, lots of things. And so the main thing what we did was basically feature elimination. You start with all possible descriptors, geometric descriptors, which you can think about. And then you optimize until you find those which are really are responsible for the differences uh, which you see. Basically, you don't need a million descriptors, you clamp them down to the smallest set, which explains the observed differences in the feature. So we ended up with, so just to show how the analysis goes through lots of features to the, you can eliminate them all, but of course you stop somewhere at the sweet spot where you're still not overfitting data. Okay, so after that, uh, we can do clustering. This is over all trajectories. The clustering is done by um, TSNE method where it's not linear. You basically just go for the similarities and differences. You cl cluster things in multidimensional space by similarities and differences in the feature without the features, without the um uh, linearity it, it's not reversible it's basically done by monte carlo of uh, gravity centers after you have the tisney plot you can cluster them actually by another simulation deciding which particle which point belongs to which cluster uh in this plot if you're not familiar with tisney plots uh, x and y don't mean anything it's just the kind of you break your egg into two-dimensional surface and you stare at the two-dimensional surface instead of a uh, multi-dimensional surface. So it's a just a uh, technique of dimensionality reduction, not based on reversibility, non-linear technique of dimensionality reduction. So X and Y mean nothing. Although in each cluster, the points are more similar than between the clusters and similarity you define in multi-dimensional space. That's the essence of it. Okay, so once we've done that, we ended up with just several features, uh, diagonal uh, distance across the channel, and the confirmation of a weird 617 uh, and Alanin's 617 side chain, which we were not considering as an in initial patch of the, <coughs> of the gate, but it's right adjacent to the gate. So the confirmation of the side chain together, which is in this table somewhere, uh, together with the distance across the channel basically tells you the state of the gate. Uh, once we did this clustering, so let me just basically put it back into something digestible like this. So we, I recolored the <coughs> I recolored the clusters by the oh sorry no I didn't say that I should have. Okay, so we we did this uh, clustering by geometry only geometric descriptions of the gate. And then inside the clusters, we pulled up a representative structure for each of them and computed water permeation because we run equilibrium MD simulations. We don't have enough ions, we just look at the water. So we computed how much water permeates through the structure, which is representative for specific channel. And now for specific cluster, sorry, I'm telling you I'm just like, Right, and so basically if I do that and I rank now clusters in terms of the ability to permeate water. So this is a, again, idiosyncratic coloring scheme, but uh, you can tell why we had to do it. The closed one is green, no water permeation. The majority are in this peak cluster, which is basically the middle ground. But there are lots of clusters in MD simulation where permeation is a little bit higher or a little bit lower than this peak cluster. So we get some diversity in the channel 
water permission and we're very happy. So we clamp it down to only four states, closed, open one, open two, and a little weird one, which is really wide open and permits lots of water, that purple one, and we say, okay, we, we got it, right? So after the simulation, the channel basically diversified itself enough to show different conductance levels, and we can match more or less physiology through the structure, from the structures through the simulations to physiology. We can say, yes, we see at least three conductance levels. We don't see the first one. The channel didn't open too wide. So we basically assume we assign three different conductance levels. This is closed. This is open one. This is open two. And there are representative structures for each of them. And we are very happy. We send the paper to the journal. And the journal comes back. And the journal is nature. So it comes back and says, Hmm, water, who cares about water? It permits more water, shows ions, naturally. So we went to do ions. And how do you do ions? Ions are much more difficult thing to simulate. So uh, the most reliable way is to drag the ions through the channel and compute energy which it takes for the ion to go in different positions of the ion. So we're computing potential of mean force for the ion in umbrella sampling simulations. So we're resetting the simulations. We take a single ion. This shows how we stabilize the whole structure so it doesn't collapse on itself. Because ion is charged particle. You're dragging it into the membrane. It's really through the gate, which is sometimes almost closed. It doesn't really like it. The whole system doesn't like to be stable. So this is our stabilizing structure. So we compute PMFs by dragging the ions through the channel. You can see here in this picture, it's a closed channel, and of course, the energy goes through the roof in the middle where the hydrophobic patch is. There is no water. Ion doesn't want to be here, so I, I don't even want to qualify this energy, but I'll show you the graph. It, it exists, so we did umbrella sampling simulations for this one-dimensional stretch. And then our representative cluster O1, representative cluster O2, O3, and you can see, you can compare PMFs. This is closed. This is O1, O2, O3. So there is a clean distinction. Clearly, there is, I can, once I have a PMF, in principle, I can use diffusion equation to predict conductance. I didn't do it, but I can do it. Um, but the reviewers, of course, want direct, basically, do direct simulation, so it works. Well, I can tell you in advance. Ion, people run simulations of ions through the channels in applied voltage. It really doesn't work. At least it does not work quantitatively. Uh, force fields are not very good. Membrane, but, uh, the membrane, uh, epsilon, who knows what it is. It's really not that. But it's really very low. Therefore, you expect polarizability should play a role. Ion goes into the protein with water. Attached the water polarizability should change in the channel. We all know that. So basically, there is no quantitative way to compute dragging of the or just passing of the ions through the water. So a typical simulation, and we repeat it exactly as is standard in the literature. Apply 600 millivolt voltage, apply enormous amount of ions, and basically push the thing through, and it works. So we know that the potentials are too, too rigid. Exchanges are not good enough. So when you pump up the voltage and uh, concentration of the ions, the, the electrostatic force just push, pushes things through without really breaking the channel because everything is overstabilized in the molecular dynamic simulation. This is classic. People usually do not discuss it. This is um, people in the know about electrostatics where I can easily say, yeah, I can tell you in advance, it will not work in the physiological concentrations. However, if you pump up the voltage and you run the simulations, these structures do demonstrate the difference in conductance. So we did this actually uh, just like the literature does. We applied the voltage to the membrane, we run simulations. It's extremely slow and tedious and uh, you need many replicas to collect any kind of statistics. Ions have tendency to get stuck in the channel and sit there happily. They don't necessarily uh, pass through the channel in nanoseconds. They can take a millisecond to go through if they want. 
So these are my curves. They were good enough because this is more or less state of art in the literature. Uh, so we have difference in O1, O2, and O3 conductance on average in all these simulations. Honestly, I like PMFs better, but we have two different means, two different, entirely different setups of the simulations to demonstrate that these structures do conduct ion different, ions differently. And it is consistent with water. If you look at the table, water conductance is an excellent proxy for the ion conductance. So our kind of ranking remains very um, supportive, both by PMF and by direct simulations. And this is basically uh, was our big <coughs> success story, although took enormous amount of simulations. OK, so this is AMPA. All my conclusions, I probably skipped the conclusion. Could you tell me the time? How much do I have? If I have any. So I need to just wrap up. OK, naturally. Uh, right. So five minutes or to wrap up, I, I will show a little bit of uh, NMDA because I, I, I skipped the intro. So I already said that the second kind of glutamate receptor, the one which is permeates calcium and is blocked by magnesium. I did show this beginnings of this story some time ago at this meeting, so some people might remember. Uh, I'll sh show very quickly what I really wanted to show. So basically, this is just to show physiologically it is a block. Um, there is no such a well-resolved NMD structure, so we had to remodel transmembrane domain. This is basically where magnesium is bound inside the selectivity filter. There are six asparagine molecules which can coordinate magnesium. This is basically a side view of the, again, magnesium coordinated in the middle by six asparagines. We force all six asparagines to coordinate it to begin with. And then we start the simulation with magnesium and with calcium. And of course, they are nearly similar. They come out similar. This is the PMF, just what I showed for sodium and AMPA receptor. Going in the middle of the channel through the selectivity filter and pushed out. And of course, no ion likes it. So these are big energies. Uh, but roughly, I cannot tell why the calcium is different by magnesium. Moreover, I can tell you this is a really bad simulation for magnesium. It's a perfectly converged PMF. You cannot say it's wrong. It is absolutely wrong because it's a wrong coordinate. This is not the slowest coordinate for magnesium ion. For calcium, yes. For magnesium, no. So for, for magnesium, it never exchanges ligands. Maybe that's better. Like it traps the ligand in the simulation and stays there. So you don't sample through configurations. You won't see it by, so your PMF is converged, but you never will see it. Uh, that you actually just sitting in one single configuration at a time. So your umbrellas are not matched if you're doing umbrella sampling, because this is five asparagine coordinated. This is four asparagine simulated. They never cross. So you really never actually connect. OK, so in order to do this, let me skip through all the complications of magnesium modeling. So we model it now magnesium permeation as ligand exchange problem. So in each step, it changes coordination. And this is how we run umbrellas. So basically, we pull a ligand out of the coordination cell of the ion and let it relax. And water substitutes in. So we get curves like this. Then. <laughs> I can do it like from six coordinated, I pull each at a time. I get six of these. They're different, as you can see. Some of them never like to converge because you pull out the ligand in the middle of the channel, nowhere to go. But if I do it sequentially with the probability of the best ions, then I can basically get these barriers on and the equilibriums matched. And this is my PMF. So this is a good one. If I do it in the wrong order, do I have it? I don't have a bad one anyway. So basically, I, to compare with what I started with, this is the dragging through the channel. And this is doing the ligand. So from minus 2 to about 6, magnesium binds stronger. Moreover, one can easily guess that there are such a huge barriers for exchange, it will take forever. So we think that magnesium blocks the ion by 
arresting this exchange by just taking forever. So it doesn't like to permeate energetically, but it also it's a kinetic trap to a large extent because barriers are really high. So they are microseconds for magnesium, right? Okay, so if you go in the wrong order, you get huge energy. So it kind of works. So this is, and if we do two ligands at a time, just to convince ourselves that that four asparagine coordinated structure is the best. So this is where we get that four coordinated magnesium structures in two different organizations was the best. So we got it from the here, from the sequential, it goes all water, orange, then one asparagine, two asparagines, three asparagines, four asparagines, five and six. So four is the best. And indeed in two dimensional umbrellas, we do get that four is the best. I think I have to stop. We have a little bit of conclusion about magnesium block. Uh, choice of reaction coordinate is really important. And sometimes, like if you're not with the slowest reaction coordinate, you're completely screwed. No error analysis method will show you that something is wrong. It's just, it's, it looks benign. Uh, calcium exchanges ligands quickly, just like all other mono, mono valentines. So you can just drag things in and hope that the configurations will work out in the simulations. But for magnesium, one has to deal with the connecting configurations and quantitative modeling of ions is a little bit away from us still although there are there is there, there is good development on force field side it's still slow so simulating things which i showed to you only are possible with uh, for fixed fixed um, potentials fixed charge potentials and graphical cards, basically. <laughs> okay, so these are my conclusions. I should be able, I should be able to say some acknowledgements to my collaborators. So these are uh, people who did the work. My collaborators are Jon Johnson, Alexander Sabalevsky, Olesi Sai for machine learning and some funding. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Any... Um, so what do you think is the difference between calcium and magnesium and how does the voltage help the magnesium dissociate? Um, okay, so in, 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 in our initial guess, it was all purely these kinetics of exchanges of the ligands from the first solvation shell. So there is a three orders of magnitude of difference and that's probably the main difference, so that it goes in very slowly. And the overall binding is not very strong. It's a little bit stronger than for, cal uh, for calcium, but this is where I would not put my money on because of the force field. I hope. <laughs> yes, but. Uh, but so basically they're close, but magnesium binds a little bit more stronger. So when the voltage, but then if you think in terms of energy, then this difference in the voltage of about 25 millivolts uh, per angstrom will give you roughly, I forget, like 5 kcal out per mole. So basically it will kick out the ion, which is bound by maybe that order of magnitude of binding. So the, And there is a very big barrier in the... Uh, to drag it through. So the, the thing which I show there's a bad, for, oh, sorry. Ah, you shouldn't be seeing this at all. Yeah, here it is, this thing. So this is where it's 20. So this is where the order of the ligands were, were dragged out of the magnesium in order to facilitate permeation. So we try to make it go through, but you see it's like 20 kick up or more. It just will never go there. So it kicks back out, but yeah, energetically it does it up in terms of uh, that it comes in and you drop the voltage, you, you give it a little bit like 5K cal extra and it goes out. Uh, thanks, Maria, quite interesting. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of neat that you have the ions that flow and carry information and others that block. I was just wondering if there are specific ion concentrations in the synapse. Is there some 
you know, and how do the ion, the magnesium ions get in and out of the neurons, things like that. So are, are, are there specific ion concentrations in the, in the synapse, like more divalence or more? Yeah. There Just are, a naive question. Yeah, yeah, but it's a very good question. I, I, I go around my biology friends and ask them, and they all give different answers. So, yeah, so, so there is definitely significantly smaller concentration of divalence than monovalence. So the majority of the voltage uh, at the membrane is maintained by the monovalent cations. The, you have more potassium outside, more sodium inside, or vice versa. I'm kind of brain sleeping right now. Uh, so, so, so the so-called nurse potential. So when you have potassium on one side, sodium on the other, you will have a little bit voltage across just from that, even with equal concentrations. Uh, Divalence are at least order or two orders magnitude smaller concentrations everywhere. So they specific, they are metabolic ions. They participate in in biological, in triggering things, in initiating some sort of biological reactions. So they are controlled one by one. So even permeating one or two calciums will trigger the whole cascade of bi biochemistry in the cell. So they, they are being controlled. There are, uh, these channels are kind of utilizing the science, but uh, in the cell, the, my third part, which I didn't have to talk about, is that there is a big class of uh, also tetrameric channels, which are called transit potential receptors. They control metabolism of divalence. So they bring them in and out as needed in, in different cells everywhere. So there are plenty of active, uh, that is, things which eat up energy and just passive transports which control this kind of balances of the concentrations. And they're extremely small, they're micromolar. Hi, thanks, very nice. Uh, so I had a, a couple of questions. So uh, so to this one, you had uh, um, six asparagines, right? Six asparagines. Yeah, it's a, so it's a tetrameric general, so it's... Uh, it has two, uh, it's, it's a on, hetero... Uh, Hetero. It's a heterotetrameric. It has glycine, uh, two glycine, two glutamate mm -hmm. parts, and one of them has two asparagines, and the one, another one, just one. Mm -hmm. So, one so what does the what do? So my my I guess first question is, what do the selectivity filters look like in both of the uh, the channels that you studied? Well, I showed you a couple of movies. So in AMBA, it's quite disorganized, and basically it just loops around and. Uh, ions go sometimes they go sequentially sometimes they, they they can basically just bypass each other in 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 amp it's easy it's just cation channel in uh nmd it's well organized so this is top view this is side view molus so they are on the tips of the loops uh of the uh, reentrant loop and so the, the majority of action happens here. And the asparagines are fairly long, so the iron bound to asparagines can go almost in the middle of the channel very easily. So when we're running simulations in my graphs, you've seen, of course, sorry, I was so fast, I couldn't concentrate on anything, but sorry, but it was, sorry. Uh, here's the span of how much iron moves when it's attached to six asparagines. That's the several angstroms kind of, mobility of the ion being in the same cluster. So it sort of hangs on this uh, asparagine side chains, but they're flexible, so it's kind of... Mm -hmm. And there's nothing... On the ropes. There are no charge side chains around? Or, no, okay. no, amazing. And the no. same in the... Uh, in FAMPA. Yeah, the there is a variant of FAMPA which is calcium permeable that has arginine. So that has charge group, but these are all neutral, yeah. And they're known to be, they like magnesium. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the AMPA, is, is, the, is it selective for a certain type of ions? No, it's monovalent cations. Okay. Remember. Mm -hmm. And then, so have you tried doing the electric field in the... We did, we did, yeah, at some point, yeah, mm -hmm. naturally. <laughs> I stick everything into Delphi when I, well, I have my own, but... Pretty much Delphi. Uh, yeah, they, they, they will be very, basically it will look like a funnel for the cations, yeah. Uh, and, and in the simulations, you also, so you said you have very small uh, concentration of, of the valent ions. And so do you also include the, the monovalent ones in the simulation? 
but yes uh basically in the simulation this is my this is picture of the simulation so when we have divalence we control them so you're not trying to run a free simulation of like let's see if uh calcium or magnesium will find its site so you start with the iron divalent in the binding site and at the best you look at it to leave uh but so these are mostly potassium and chloride in a physiological concentration just to match experiment and we usually have divalence enough to match experimental setup but if you're interested in iron in the specific site you would want to put it there initially Otherwise, so that was for the NMDA as well, right? That, yeah. That's what yeah, for, for both. Yeah, basically all simulations okay. are set up like this, pretty much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these are started from the the experimental structures. Yes, mm -hmm. all of them. Uh, NMDA are modeled structures. We model them ourselves because they are they do not exist experimentally. Yep. Very nice. I was actually interested also in the machine learning part, but I'll talk to you more. I've been told, right? Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, uh, just to follow her question, I'm also interested in the machine learning part, so I uh, ask uh, for that. So uh, what made you uh, think you need to use the machine learning model? And uh, what are the uh, main features? and how you train the model? Uh, that's my questions. OK, um, let me try to be brief. So in this case, we use machine learning. So in my experience, the majority of machine learning for the data which biology is able, capable of producing will be various kinds of regressions. So you rarely can depart from regression by the amount of data which everyone has. So you would want to, to go fancier, like networks, forest trees, whatever. But in reality, what you do usually some sort of regression. So in this case, in my, if I find this quickly, uh, we used, um, so you, you start basically with thinking of all possible features which might be relevant. I lost it. Um, so you, you think of okay distances, the dihedral angles, um, I don't know what areas. So so anything you can think about. So you still have this part of human intelligence when you have to come up with a set of good features before you train the model. So and our initial model was basically take all the pairwise distances of everything, uh, lots of dihedral angles on the side chains which are nearby, kind of. Uh, participate in action you know, on the parts of the helices which bend and pulled uh, close to the uh, gate somewhere. And then do regressions and and then basically slowly eliminate the, so, so you basically create the loss function. Uh, you say you want uh, the features which are basically uh, describe the structure, but not um, kind of penalize if too many features describe the structure. So the typical loss function type. And then you do regressions and uh, eventually, uh, if I find my slide, so something useful on it. So basically you, you optimize your loss function in a more or less standard way, right there, like this. Sorry, my, I'm waving my finger, you don't see it like that. So you regularize and then kind of uh, make sure it's not too sparse because basically your one feature don't overweight everything. And then you basically make sure it um, doesn't go spiky on you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then uh, the next thing, uh, so the, So you first kind of go down regression as fast as you can, almost like do a little bit of steepest descent and then switch to something like Monte Carlo so that you don't get in the lowest, uh, in the narrowest, closest local minimum. So same ideas, but they're regularized into, if I have to switch the language, it will take me another link, lecture so we can talk outside. But basically, yeah, that's that's the idea. And then you end up with like first step, you have lots of features, 
and then uh, as you're training, you kind of lose features which do not really are not sensitive to the property which you're trying to achieve, and you throw them out slowly, and you can end up with nothing at all. But you could start some, and so this is where there is no rigorous. Nothing rigorous about this optimization techniques. You basically, you decide, you still now have to decide where to stop. And that's that's where basically different people will decide differently, maybe come up with slightly different conclusions. Mm -hmm. still, still on the machine learning part, on the feature selection slash pruning, what was the objective of uh, what was the why? So what is what what are you what are you seeing in the training loss and validation loss? What was the property that you used? Difference in the poor. So the where's my result? So basically, the the main thing was to first. So we have all these uh, structures from the simulations. The create enough, so basically find enough geometric descriptors which will create uh, meaningful clusters for them. Basically, to so so in this case, in this particular case, the 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 driving force is more or less. Uh, the dimensionality reduction and clusterization of data such that we don't have, so, so that we're balancing not too simple, like I can say bigger radius is better, right? But like, will other structural features, because we have the secondary elements of structures, in addition to just distances, can we incorporate all those structural features and say this structure is meaningfully different from the other structure? So the, the well, no, not yet. No, that's that was the plan that the, the that we structure specifically by geometry, and then we check conductance. Because if I if I uh, kind of uh, st cluster directly by conductance, I'm at risk that I will create lots of very strange structures in in the same conductance level. So we didn't want to use the thing which we're actually interested in as a, a feature in the selection. So our features. This is where all geometric. So then when I make this table, I can brag about it. So that I, I cluster by a geometry, and then when I compute conductance, it lines up. So that was the kind of thing which we were trying to achieve. But in terms of clustering and selection of feature, try to create to find features which are important and pick up not too many of them. Like basically find leading features, those which are really structuring our clusters into different structures, if I explain. I, I, I hear myself, I'm really, I'm sure, as I said, like in two days, I probably will be able to explain it in three words. <laughs> okay, then thanks again, our speaker.